Okay, thanks for uh, your patience with the short uh, pause to switch the um, recording. Um, next up, we have Prov USB, block level provenance based data protection for USB storage devices, and this is going to be presented by Adam Bates. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to talk, uh, start the talk today by discussing some uh, recent history on portable media security, particularly with regards to uh, smart USB devices, the kind that uh, have some embedded coprocessor to add uh, additional features to the device. So in 2005, a little startup you might have heard of called uh, Iron Key is founded. Uh, backed by a million dollar grant by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, they produce a secure, portable uh, USB drive that performs FIPS certified uh, on-device encryption and, and user authentication. And these devices have since become pretty ubiquitous in, um, in security sensitive workplaces. Uh, Iron Key was designed to prevent data from, particularly classified data, from falling into the wrong hands. And in fact, it does that quite well. Uh, but the funny thing uh, happened that since these devices became quite popular, our, our problems with uh, USB security and portable media security haven't really gone away. Uh, in 2008, a user at uh, US Central Command inadvertently plugged in an insecure uh, USB drive that loaded the uh, silly FTC worm. Uh, it made its way onto CyberNet, uh, which is the Department of Defense's a network for transmitting classified data. In 2010, Private Manning snuck classified data past a military checkpoint on portable media uh, that uh, they had passed off as a, as a personal effect. Uh, in 2012, uh, the infamous Stuxnet worm uh, in part used a, a USB-based propagation vector to jump over an air gap um, in, a, in an isolated network in order to uh, infect nuclear centrifuges. And then in most recently in 2014, we've begun to see uh, demonstrations of USB malware uh, at the firmware layer, which is effectively invisible to anything that the host could be doing. Uh, so something that all four of these incidents have in common is that uh, smart devices like Iron Keys wouldn't be able to do anything to prevent them. And that's because uh, uh, in the past, devices like Iron Key have been focused entirely on preventing the loss or theft of data uh, when a device uh, falls into uh, the wrong hands. But there's a growing class of problems in which authorized users are knowingly or unknowingly uh, violating their system security policies with USB drives. So this talk's gonna be about what smart USB devices might be able to do for us to improve our security posture uh, when the devices are in uh, the right hands in, in some authorized user. A couple things that we're not gonna talk about today are uh, data confidentiality, because as I mentioned, uh, Iron Keys already do a pretty good job of that, Iron Keys and their peers, that is. Uh, and then also, we're not gonna worry about sort of uh, on-device antivirus scanning. Uh, the reason for that being that if we were using like signature-based uh, signature uh, antivirus software, that wouldn't really stop these targeted attacks that we're talking about or, or uh, data exfiltration either. So instead, we're going to think about uh, matters of device, for, device forensics. How can we reason about how USB devices are being used within our organization in order to answer questions such as, uh, if there's a data leak, what authorized users could have possibly leaked to this data? Um, how did uh, the intruder reach you know, this isolated network that we thought you know, wasn't connected to the internet? How did things go wrong? And then finally, which machines in our system could potentially be affected? We're gonna go a step past that and also try to provide some uh, real-time integrity protection as well. Uh, namely, how do we prevent USB-born malware um, that's you know, perhaps uh, been infecting our, our employee network from reaching our, our high-value uh, isolated networks? So our solution for this uh, is called Prob USB. Uh, Prob USB is a new uh, smart USB device um, that's made up of several components. Uh, first, it has a mechanism to uh, reliably identify hosts that the device is connected to uh, using uh, TPM-based remote attestation over the USB interface. Uh, second, we go on to provide uh, forensics for USB devices um, in, in the form of data provenance. We capture a, a complete description of all of the hosts within an organization's interaction with with one particular device. And then finally, we go on to uh, demonstrate that we can use uh, USB data provenance as a means of uh, integrity assurance by preventing uh, low integrity data on a device from, from reaching a high value host. 
So uh, I mentioned sort of security sensitive organizations a couple times already, and I do want to stress that at least in the, you know, the demonstration I'll be discussing today, we're not imagining that Prob USB is necessarily for everyone. Uh, we're thinking about a, um, a highly managed security sensitive enterprise environment where uh, USB is already sort of thought of as uh, a very dangerous thing. Uh, if, you're, if your place of work has a system administrator that's walking down the hallways, uh, super gluing USB port shut, uh, then our solution might be for them. And particularly what we're thinking about is uh, we're imagining an environment where uh, there is a centralized security office where uh, mobile computing devices like USB sticks are going to be periodically checked out and returned. Uh, this might seem like kind of a big ask, but in fact this is already a common practice in some, uh, in some companies, particularly in the case of international travel. Uh, you might lease out a couple of um, mobile computing devices and then at the end of the trip uh, have those devices uh, returned to that office. So we will We'll assume that. We're also going to assume that all of our hosts in the company are equipped with the TPM. And finally, we're going to imagine that um, an administrator can specify um, some partition of hosts within their, their company uh, between uh, low integrity machines, such as our, our average Joe employees' workstations, and then our, our high integrity machines, uh, things like uh, a privileged administrator workstation or um, a, a terminal for accessing classified information um, or an isolated production network. All right, so with that in mind, uh, Prob USB set out to satisfy the following uh, security properties. Uh, first, that it has an absolutely minimal trusted computing base. Uh, in particular, we didn't want to trust any software that might be running on the host. Second, we wanted to collect audit information that exhibited uh, this property of forensic validity. And that's the idea that uh, we can provide a complete description of how this particular device has been used within our organization. Um, and if for some reason we can't provide that, uh, then any loss of that information has to at least be detectable um, by the administrator that's inspecting it. Our device had to be tamper-proof in that um, anything that was happening on the host uh, wouldn't be able to disrupt the mon monitoring mechanisms that we introduce on board the device. Uh, and then finally, uh, this goal of integrity assurance that um, our device must be able to prevent low integrity data from flowing to one of our, our high integrity machines. So uh, the first step in providing these goals was establishing a reliable means of, of identifying the hosts that were connecting to our device. Uh, and for that, we turned to past work by Butler and colleagues uh, that demonstrates um, a method of performing remote TPM attestations uh, over the USB interface. Um, so if you're not aware, TPMs or trusted platform modules are uh, widely available security coprocessors um, on, on most um, desktops and servers uh, that can be configured to perform a measured boot of a system uh, in that every single piece of the operating stack as it's loaded uh, is hashed, and then that hash is, is stored in secure memory. Uh, a signed copy of these hashes can uh, be obtained by remote hosts that issue one of these uh, TPM uh, attestation challenges. However, because uh, USB is a master-slave protocol, it's actually uh, somewhat non-trivial to be able to uh, port this notion of remote attestations uh, to the USB interface. Uh, so we do that as follows. Uh, during regular USB enumeration, which is effectively the, the handshake for identifying a USB device, um, one, of the, um, one of the identifiers requested by the host is the vendor ID. So we simply uh, provide a custom Prov USB vendor ID to flag to the host that we're requesting a TP PM attestation. Uh, following normal device enum enumeration, but before the device is actually loaded, um, our host then sends a, a device specific command message that requests a, that the, the device generate a 20 byte nonce. Uh, this nonce is then used uh, by the host to uh, generate one of those TPM quote commands, uh, and that's returned to the device along with the uh, public key of the TPM. So at this point, the device has all it needs to verify the configuration of the host. Uh, and if that is successful, the device then uh, mounts the storage partition and uh, SCSI operations can begin to uh, occur. So uh, the, the next question that we faced when designing this device was, uh, we know that we're, we're going to capture these, uh, you know, these IO events of how the device is being used. Uh, so at, at what layer of operation should we be performing that monitoring? Uh, probably the thing that's most intuitive, and it certainly was to us at the start, was that we would just monitor file IO in order to record this information. So uh, a device connects to a host, they read and write some files, and we keep track of that. 
It turned out there were a couple problems there. Uh, first, that uh, you know, USB, universal serial buses, uh, you know, these devices are supposed to be universal. And the moment that we start talking about uh, file systems, we're introducing a dependency that might not uh, work well in, in all environments. Uh, maybe we want a private USB device that works on a standard OS X file system as well as, as a Windows file system. Um, so that sort of limits the universality of the approach. Instead, we chose to uh, go a layer lower and record these audit events uh, down at the block layer, um, which uh, maintains universality for all SCSI-based uh, storage uh, and also provides finer range tracking. So we can say something a little bit um, uh, more detailed than, you know, this device read this file. We can say this is the piece of the file uh, that this device read. So uh, this is how we collect the information. Um, after it's collected, it turns out it's fairly straightforward to translate from blocks, which are a bit obtuse, uh, back to the file names that we can uh, speak intelligently about. So as we're collecting this stream of um, sort of basic read-write events um, on board the device, uh, eventually this information is processed into a, uh, it's a, a provenance graph that describes the uh, uh, conclusive holistic history of how this device is being used. Um, so this is basically a dependency graph. Uh, starting from uh, the first point in time over here, we see uh, that we have one block that's read by a number of hosts. Eventually host B uh, writes this block, creating a, a new version version of that and uh, that block subsequently used uh, by other hosts. So this is the information that the administrator would eventually be able to look at to reason about what's happening over portable media uh, in their organization. Uh, the next step was uh, how do we use this information in order to provide integrity assurances and, and mandatory access control. And it turns out uh, it's actually quite uh, straightforward to take a provenance graph um, and labels associated with that provenance graph and then dynamically infer the state of new objects as they are created. So an example of that, uh, in our integrity model, uh, we assume that uh, every single host in our system has been assigned a static integrity label, uh, whereas the data uh, on board the device has have variable integrity labels. So we might imagine at time zero, all of our uh, blocks on the, the system are marked at a high integrity level. However, later on, if uh, a low integrity host happens to write to that block, then we can uh, transition uh, that particular data block to a low integrity state. So given the sense of um, hosts have static labels, uh, data objects have uh, dynamically inferred labels from our provenance graph, um, our, our integrity uh, 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 access control system is as follows. Um, for write operations, of course, high integrity hosts can write to high integrity data. Uh, low integrity hosts can write to low integrity data. However, if a low integrity host tries to write to a high integrity data block, then we transition that block down uh, to a low integrity state. Uh, secondly, for read operations, uh, high can, can flow to high and low can flow to low, of course. Uh, but if a high integrity host attempts to read a low integrity data block, then on board the device, we stop that operation from occurring. Uh, so using this, I'll show you in a few minutes that we can uh, do some pretty nifty things in terms of preventing the spread of malware in or an organization. Um, our, our, our argument for the security of these properties uh, is as follows. Um, for the minimal trusted computing base, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Prob USB uh, performs a full authentication and verification of the, the host uh, via a TPM attestation. Um, if that uh, TPM attestation is successful, then the host can access the storage partition like normal. Um, otherwise, if something's wrong on that device, say you know the, the TPM daemon that we need to do this isn't connected, then we can uh, deny that uh, access to the storage partition. So either we identify the host or we don't. Uh, we don't trust any of the software that's running on the host. Uh, the forensic validity of our approach um, has to do with that assumption we made about uh, the presence of a security office. Um, so we'd imagine on the order of um, on, oh, per perhaps days to weeks, um, these devices would be returned to the, uh, the, the administrators of the organization, at which point they can extract uh, data provenance and, and reason about how the system's being used. Uh, a, a failure to return that device in a timely fashion uh, would trigger a security incident that would prompt a response. So either we have information about how the device is used, or uh, we have an alert that a particular employee in our organization uh, could be doing uh, something that's not so good. 
So this might seem a little bit arcane, uh, this need to, uh, an analog approach to pulling this data uh, off of the device. The reason we adopted this method was uh, in a lot of these organizations that we're, we're thinking PravUSB could be helpful for, they're actually quite concerned about uh, sort of ad hoc wireless networks and other things that might be used for covert channels in the organization. So if you're, if you're super gluing your USB port shut right now, you might also be really worried about uh, Bluetooth connectivity or, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer wireless networks. Uh, so for that reason, we decided to go with, you know, a, a more uh, uh, physical extraction approach. Uh, our system is tamper-proof in that uh, the Prov USB logic, um, as I'm about to show you, is actually happening beneath the storage layer of the device. And as a result, the host machine can't affect uh, the connection logic that we're, they're using there. Um, we would need to adopt a, a deployment model that would be similar to Iron Key in that we need to have some level of tamper resistance in our hardware to fully embody this property, though. Uh, finally, for integrity assurance, um, our, our correctness sort of harkens back to our ability to dynamically infer uh, those integrity labels, and it's been demonstrated in past work that uh, given a correct uh, provenance graph of a system, you can correctly infer uh, the present security state of every, any given data object. So uh, we uh, implemented our system as well um, on a Gumstick's computer on module uh, using uh, Yocto Linux. Uh, the Linux operating system is able to uh, expose itself as a device to another host using a uh, USB on the go, so that's how we achieved that. There are a couple features that I'm not gonna be able to delve into uh, during the talk today, but very briefly, uh, one thing we did, uh, collecting this type of auto data can impose some storage overhead concerns, uh, so we attempted to mitigate that uh, by introducing a filter filtering optimization that effectively, you know, if you read the same block multiple times, we don't need multiple records of that. So it took uh, redundant events and uh, removed them from um, our logs in order to improve the storage overhead. Uh, second, we implemented one of these tools that you can use to translate from blocks to file names and back. Uh, in our case, we uh, used the FAT16 file system uh, and created a utility called F2B. All right, so there are a number of uh, important uh, questions that we had to ask in our, our evaluation. Uh, the first was, uh, we're now introducing a TPM-based TPM attestation where there once was none. Uh, TPMs are uh, fun devices, but they are not very fast, so this was potentially a cause for concern. So uh, we benchmarked uh, uh, USB enumeration uh, using a couple of uh, sort of stock dumb USB devices, and then we did it uh, using our gumstick device when our uh, Prov USB features weren't enabled, and then finally we did it with Prov USB. So uh, no, these, uh, these cheaper, you know, non-smart USB devices are actually quite slow with device enumeration as well. Um, with the, running the Octo Linux system, uh, it's, it's much faster, just 65 milliseconds for enumeration. Uh, when we introduced the TPM attestation, we added 800 milliseconds overhead to that. Uh, so that seems uh, quite bad, but uh, one thing to notice, about half of that is due to uh, just waiting for the host to respond, which gives you a sense of, of how fast the TPM operation can uh, complete to begin with. And then most importantly, this is just a one-time overhead that happens uh, when we first plug the USB device into the system. Uh, so, th you know, this isn't necessarily a deal breaker at all here. This is barely gonna be noticeable. Uh, moving on to the question of uh, runtime overhead, though, which is much more important, um, we again sort of compared, uh, ran a series of benchmarks that compared our Prov USB device to other uh, dumb USB devices. In this case, we ran uh, the file bench utility in file server mode uh, to see what was going on. Uh, particularly as the file size um, of, of the file bench test increases, we see that the dumb USB devices uh, start significantly outperforming uh, the Prov USB device. Um, and then we see the, the same thing both uh, in latency uh, and then also in, um, in the throughput of the system. Uh, so this is potentially uh, a little bit troubling, but we're also not talking about uh, damningly bad throughput here either. Uh, perhaps a better question to ask would be, uh, how, how does this actually shake out in practice? Does our device turn out to be slower or is this just an artifact of, of intense micro benchmarking? 
So to determine that, we ran a series of uh, more realistic workloads uh, for considering how our device uh, might perform. Uh, we launched a KVM instance where the disk image was on board a Prav USB device. We uh, ran the Tor browser off of our USB device. And then finally, we ran some uh, antivirus scans uh, off of the devices. And so for, uh, for our Kingston and SanDisk, um, you know, unsophisticated USB devices, um, we actually see instances where uh, we outperform uh, those devices. Devices, and that's simply because we're using um, faster, faster systems. Um, but particularly uh, when uh, the host is able to cache a lot of information that's being accessed, uh, we see Prav USB does quite well. Uh, the one case where we had a high overhead here when we ran the antivirus software was due to the fact that there was a lot of cache misses because uh, we were touching literally every single uh, block um, on the device. So sure enough, if we took the antivirus software and immediately ran it a second time, uh, once the cache is fully loaded, uh, we see the overhead go down. Uh, but for the most part, there's reason to believe here that uh, you're not gonna really see any performance cost uh, under realistic workloads, uh, even intense realistic workloads, uh, when you're using this device compared to another uh, stock USB device. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, one final evaluation question we faced was, uh, is this going to generate so much audit information that uh, we can't even store it on a modern uh, USB storage partition? And so here's the amount of audit information that we generated uh, on those uh, file bench tests. You'll see it worse when uh, the file size was quite small. Uh, we generated 800 kilobytes of information uh, during the uh, during the uh, entire uh, workload, um, and you know, relative to uh, the size of modern USB flash drives, this is really quite modest. Uh, one thing we did note here is that our filtering optimization actually didn't uh, work quite as well as we thought, and that was because of the amount of aggressive hashing that modern operating, or sorry, not hashing, uh, amount of uh, aggressive caching that modern operating systems use. So our, our optimizations didn't turn out to be optimizations because the host was already doing them. Uh, so you know, just to demonstrate uh, the, the correctness of our approach, uh, when we ran the same test with uh, direct I.O., uh, it turns out uh, our filtering optimizations do quite well at uh, reducing the overall size of the audit log. So uh, before we wrap up, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some scenarios where this uh, Prav USB device might be useful. Um, in this scenario, we have a just two hosts, uh, a low integrity host uh, that is employee Bob's workstation, and then uh, we have administrator Alice, who's on a, a privileged uh, administrator machine, which is therefore high integrity. And we've got a Prav USB device that uh, plugs into employee Bob's workstation, and as a result, uh, maybe some uh, malware gets installed on it, uh, which in this case will just use the uh, now defunct but once uh, very dangerous uh, auto run uh, vulnerabilities that were common in operating systems. So this infected Prav USB device uh, continues to propagate uh, through the, the organization for sharing uh, PowerPoint slides and what have you. Um, and eventually, you know, there's some out of band incident that occurs and Alice realizes that she's got an infection in her network. Uh, so using the information she extracts from these devices, she, she first recovers the block numbers that are associated with the auto run file using our utility. Uh, and then uh, with the captured provenance, she can look at this previously unmonitored channel of data flow with in her organization in order to trace the chain of infections uh, back to Bob's computer. So uh, in a second scenario, uh, now let's think about our integrity assurance property. Uh, if Bob had infected this Prav USB device, uh, and then uh, Alice uh, accidentally plugged it into her computer, here's what would happen. Uh, basically nothing. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, when the infection was spread from the device, uh, Bob was running a low integrity workstation. Uh, and so that uh, data block associated with the auto run file was marked as low integrity. So when the device is plugged into Alice's workstation, which is high integrity, uh, the file is being uh, prevented uh, from, from being read from the host. And as a result, uh, the malware can't spread to our, our most sensitive machines machines. Uh, wrapping up, uh, one thing that I want to take you, want you to take away from this talk is that uh, smart USB devices can do a lot more than just protecting the confidentiality of our data. Uh, in fact, uh, on-device forensics, uh, particularly when uh, supplemented with uh, network monitoring, allows us to reason uh, in a more complete fashion about data movement in large, complex organizations. Uh, sysadmins are very scared of USB, and the re main reason for that now is because they can't monitor those data flows. Uh, this gives them a means of doing that. 
And then finally, with the case of our integrity-based uh, or integrity-oriented access controls, um, even if we can specify some basic rules about um, partitioning our network between uh, low sensitivity and high sensitivity machines, uh, we can use smart USB devices in order to prevent uh, low integrity, uh, potentially malware-oriented data um, from reaching our most critical uh, you know, endpoints and systems. Uh, so I'm not the lead author on this paper. I just wanted to give credit where credit was due today. Um, and, and using his words, uh, all bugs were introduced by uh, Dave Tien, also all of the fancy bells and whistles. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Uh, also, you can reach Dave uh, via root at davejingtien.org. Uh, Thanks very much for your time. Okay, we have time for a few questions. question, but um, so when you plug the USB device into a legitimate host um, and it does all the authorization, what every request after that, are they uh, integrity checked and is there authentication on those requests or are they sent in plain text? Right, so uh, yeah, we're not providing confidentiality of, um, of uh, data that's crossing over the, the physical wire, right? So we, we identify the host. Um, we're not providing any confidentiality at the packet level, although that's, uh, there's some cool work at Usenix Security. Um, both Cinch and USB filter sort of thought about those problems okay. of, uh, of uh, packet confidentiality. So my, my question is, yeah. what happens if, um, and a malicious employee sort of has like a USB condom in which they initially pass through all the requests, but then they maliciously inject um, packets to request different file system blocks that net, and then they deny the request to actually go to the USB or the host or vice versa. Right, so that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess uh, for you to deploy that type of device, you would need to be sitting at the workstation, right? Yeah. So provided that you have access to the workstation in order to prompt the USB enumeration, um, there, there might not be a difference in practice. I, you know, I guess for that to be a problem, I would have to sit down at somebody else's desk and then deploy this device to create a false audit trail that you know, they did something bad when actually it was me that did something bad. Um, and so, so in practice, provided that you, you know, have a, a somewhat security literate employee base, I'm not sure if that'd be a huge problem. But yeah, there's, there's certainly uh, issues there with um, the possibility of uh, sort of man in the middles within hardware, um, which you know, uh, is something to think about. Okay, thank you. Hi, so it's Phil from Concordia University. I just have a quick question mm -hmm. about the implementation. I haven't read the paper. So you mentioned the system relies on uh, the uh, TPM uh, attestation capabilities. So do you use uh, SRTM or DRTM? Uh, that's a great question, and I have to admit that I don't know it off the top of my head. Oh. Um, it's certainly in the paper, uh, and also Dave would probably be the guy to ask that because he implemented okay. those features. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay, thanks. Hey, Manuel Egele, Boston University. Nice talk, really nice work. So what I was wondering, in, also in the motivation that you gave, like passing PowerPoints around, so what you, I would expect that what you see in a real organization would be like a network of how multiple of those dongles are being exchanged between different machines. How do you keep track of provenance of data on different devices if you don't trust any of the hosts? Yeah, that's, uh, that's so we, we do not uh, trust the host, but we do establish the, uh, the identity of the host, right? Um, so yeah, we don't uh, tackle that in the paper, but this would be uh, trivially easy to start integrating uh, multiple devices uh, information together. Uh, all we'd have to do is add an identifier for which device the particular data object was on, um, but the, hosts, the host identity are persistent across multiple devices. Um, so uh, great point. I think that'd be an interesting thing to delve into, but um, yeah, it shouldn't be any problem. Hi. Um, I didn't quite understand. Um, you had a usage there on the data leakage prevention. Um, do you have an assumption there that the company does not use USB sticks that are not equipped with this technology, or how does it work? Right, yeah, so yeah, we're assuming that there aren't USB drives uh, passing, passing into the organization um, that don't have this, uh, this technology. Again, we're sort of relying on uh, out-of-band security enforcement for that. Um, it's certainly the case in a lot of organizations that you're only supposed to be using iron keys right now. They're, um, so they're that's searching. sort of... Sorry. Uh, right, yeah, and so you know, if, you, if you walked into one of these companies with um, a USB device that wasn't an iron key, uh, either one or two things have hap could happen. One, either no one notices, 
and you've broken the uh, sort of the data confi can cut, uh, confidentiality policy of the organization. Uh, the other thing is uh, they might try to perform some host layer uh, detection of which devices are being plugged into the machine, um, which is admittedly imperfect. Uh, but if that was there, you'd have at least some assurance that um, you know your uh, you know the, the the USB drive that you're carrying around on your keychain isn't being used within your company's organization. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, it seems a little impractical, right? You don't want to search your employees on the way into the company, except maybe on some close confined perimeters, I imagine. Um, the Iron Key, so I'm not exactly familiar with Iron Key. Is it authentication or confidentiality? Yeah, so, and I'm sorry for not going delving further into it uh, in the talk, but so, so yeah, basically there's, there's a coprocessor that's performing on-device encryption of the system. Uh, when you plug it in, uh, a little uh, dialog box gets, uh, pops up that you type in your password. The password's verified on board the device and then the device gets uh, decrypted. I mean, it's I'm, I'm afraid we have to cut things off there. Oh, yeah, uh, just uh, maybe one remark. Um, there was a remark now on the hardware attack. You can do that in software, right? So you ID the TPM, but you don't link your files to the TPM. So I can, if, if you have a compromised host, you had an example of a low integrity host. Then, yeah. Um, that can be a proxy, right, for another low integrity host on your on your company, and it can relay the TBM authentication challenge response. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's so definitely a problem it, it with that. So I was asking about Iron Key. There's an interaction there with the Iron Key. What you seem to be. I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah. So certainly we're we're basing some things off TPMs, uh, cuckoo attacks where we relay messages are a problem with TPM. So there's there's an issue there. Yes. Okay. Great discussions. Um, let's thank the speaker again. And that concludes the session. Thanks, everyone.